But if you want examples of this instant knee-jerk reaction to it, think of things like, uh, well, the goose step, the stesh marsh. Now, people think of the goose step as this locked-on, rigid, uh, you're part of the machine, you're part of the cog, you're brainless, you're no individual, you're just a tool, and you're being used to kill people. That's what they think of the goose step. What do I think of the goose step? Well, as somebody who has always been interested in military history, military customs, the philosophy behind war, why we have militaries in the first place, I always saw the goose step for what it was. A march developed in the 1700s, Prussia, for the purposes of demonstrating, of course, discipline, but also things like coordination, mental toughness. Try this out for yourself. Get a nice open space. Try to goose step. Try to bring your leg up to this kind of angle. It's almost 90 degree angle while keeping your back completely straight. Now try marching at that at 120 paces per minute. And what you'll notice is that it's extraordinarily tough. It looks kind of ridiculous, you know, from the outside, but it's extraordinarily tough. As a matter of fact, it's so tough that they don't do it except when they're in front of the review stand because if they were to march that way from dawn till dusk, they'd probably hurt their spines. I see the goose step as a tool for military discipline and as a tool to show just how tough you are, mentally tough, because it's pretty damn tough to not only march in coordination, but also to march in such a tough, anatomically unfriendly way. Now, this isn't lost on some people nowadays. There's a lot of countries even today, that still use the goose step as part of drill. Whether or not it's during specific parades or just during examples of drill or during training, they still use it. You know, countries like, I don't know, Russia, Mexico, India, Argentina, the Republic of China, the People's Republic of China, they all use it. But there is that stigma that it's fascist, that it's evil, that it's yeah, it's 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 evil, and yet it has no roots in that. I mean, sure, you have uh, Mussolini trying to call it the Roman March, as if that had anything to do with the Romans, but it had nothing to do with it up to that point. But once it's associated with Germany and with Nazis, and once those are considered all evil, lumped in, bam, goose stepping is bad no matter its merits, no matter the purpose it serves in a military context, it's bad. What else? Um, we have the Prussian virtues. These are things which came out of that era of reform I mentioned, post-Napoleon. They're kind of based on like the uh, Protestant work ethic, only they're a little bit more fleshed out. Now, of course, these Prussian virtues include things like loyalty, obedience, sense of order, subordination. Yeah, you know, um, the was a social democrat chancellor Helmut Schmidt, the German chancellor, West German chancellor, who is essentially the man that they hold up as the one of the key people who brought about the economic miracle that made Germany a solid country, economically speaking. That that goes even to today. He called for a return to these Prussian virtues, and. One one of the persons in his own party, a mayor, uh, Metor, uh, Metor, Major Oscar Lafontaine, pardon me, he says that um, these virtues are perfectly suited to run a concentration camp. Loyalty, obedience, sense of order, subordination. Perfectly suited to running a concentration camp. Well, that makes sense, right? I mean, we've all been raised with this innate knowledge that everything German is bad, and that this mindless obedience that Germans seem to have is evil and it runs concentration camps. Well, 
aside from the fact that I mentioned before that their military was based on individual initiative, what other Prussian virtues were there? In fact, there was a giant list, which also included things like bravery and courage and discipline, humility, incorruptibility, restraint, sense of justice, sincerity, and one which really grates on this, something called Weltoffenheit, cosmopolitanism. So, yes, I'm sure cosmopolitanism is perfectly suited to run a concentration camp. I'm sure a sense of justice runs concentration camps. I'm sure humility runs concentration camps. No, that's an unfair accusation. But it's cherry-picking, and it's cherry-picking in such a way that all those other things are chopped off. Huh. Strong militaries. Militarism. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure that it was the strong U.S. military which kept the Cold War mostly cold. I'm pretty sure that the right of self-defense, the kind of thing which shall not be infringed, you know, human rights circles, I'm pretty sure that's not a bad thing. I mean, going back to uh, one of my personal role models, Teddy Roosevelt, the best way to prepare for peace, is the best way to preserve peace is to prepare for war. It's an acknowledgement, a rational acknowledgement, that you don't need to kill people to keep peace. You just need to be prepared to. You have to have that latent threat. The Gadsden flag. Don't tread on me. That's all it is. But strong militaries are demonized, even as we have a giant U.S. military nowadays, which is getting smaller. But we demonize it. Because clearly, big militaries are Nazi and evil. National pride. Uh, national pride, nationalism, even as a term. It's this negative nationalism. <laughs> even though the nationalism which they actually felt, the sometimes irrational pride in their country, that their country was better than others, was the same kind of feeling which all European countries had up to 1914. America today has all of this irrational pride in things that we've never done, accomplishments that our generation hasn't accomplished. We call it patriotism, but it's the same thing. So, another thing is, if you think about it, when national pride, when nationalism is held up as evil, what do we reference? Now, historians, and maybe even contemporary people at the time, they would hold up that rampant nationalism was that's that's where World War One came from and World War One was terrible. But today? No, they don't hold up World War One. They don't even know what World War One is. Oftentimes people will say to me that World War One is the first time we beat Hitler. No. They hold up Nazi Germany. They hold up Germany as an example of how nationalism is bad. While they go and have more American flags in every single house plot and every single window pane than European countries do. And if you really want to get down on this, I was reading a Wikipedia article about the history of uh, Imperial Germany. And it's talking about Wilhelm II, you know, the, the 29-year-old kid who essentially gets shoved into the seat of German emperor, you know, Eternal autocrat of one of the most powerful European countries in the world. Both of his parents were liberals. Uh, his grandfather was a much more sensible guy of Prussian heritage, right? And it says that Bismarck, the guy who was, well, of course, he you know fought some wars, but the guy who sought to maintain the status quo, who didn't completely demolish France, who didn't go on a colonial binge, the Iron Chancellor says that he Prussianized Wilhelm II. You know, the guy who causes everyone to hate Germany. Bismarck Prussianizes the bad guy. So clearly, Prussianism, Prussianizing, is a bad thing. Never minding 
that Bismarck was kicked out of office by Wilhelm II, who then proceeded to do everything that Bismarck did not want to do. But we say that he was Prussianized. So clearly Prussia is evil. So where am I going with all this? Well, the common thread is something which I would call amputation risk. I have yet to find an actual term, a fancy term like tutophobia, but I guess the fact that I'm making this video in the first place is a good example of the fact that you can't find it. Amputation risk. You got gangrene in your thumb, and the doctor's solution is to cut off your whole hand. Why? Well, you know, if, if you cut off only certain parts of the thumb, the gangrene might still be there. you got to be better safe than sorry. And besides, you know, my saw's kind of big, so it might be a little bit difficult to hit that thumb precisely. So we're just going to chop the whole hand off, and you'll be fine. Yeah, people have this tendency. I've observed this very often. People have a tendency to take one factor one handful, but certainly not the majority, handful of factors, which suddenly invalidate every other single factor, even ones which are totally unrelated. They might have absolutely nothing to do with each other. You don't need to be a Nazi to have national pride. You don't need to be a warmonger and a savage to have a competent, war-winning military. Now, Germany, Tudophobia, is just a very strong example because it has lasted for so damn long. And it's really the only thing which, this, from this period of history, which seems to stick. Like I mentioned, nobody even knows what World War I is anymore. My uh, own father, who is a descendant of the World War II generation, doesn't even know what World War I is, so what does that tell you? So Germany is a strong example. There's this very strong social slant. People are so afraid, even in those countries, that they outright ban it. They, they call it a hate crime. They arrest those people. They prosecute those people. That's how afraid they are. And yet, they're so afraid that they won't even broach the subject. Now, of course, there's these laws in the books that say they allow it for educational purposes, but I have a great difficulty in imagining they go into great detail if my own education my good old-fashioned American education didn't even go that far into detail when we are not supposed to have those same kind of paranoias. But that is what it is, I guess. Now, this makes you wonder. If humans have this tendency of turning things black and white and taking that gray area in the middle and just completely erasing it, what other things have we lost? What other... What other things have we lost? What ideas? What concepts? What understandings? What kind of interpretations of history? What have we lost? I've always been of the mind that you can learn something from everything. Including your enemies. Including complete falsehoods. You can learn something from everything. If the stuff that is involved is not correct, you can at least learn why it's not correct. If it's not accurate, if it's not good, if it's morally wrong, you can at least learn why it got there. Things like Nazi Germany, this Prussianism, these Prussian virtues, you can at least separate what was good and what was bad without completely destroying everything because of one guy with a funny looking mustache. 